Today is a big day for Dracula fans. It is the 100th anniversary of Nosferatu, the oldest surviving Dracula film. Nosferatu premiered on March 4th, 1922 in Germany, specifically in the Marble Hall of the Berlin Zoological Garden. It was even a costume party. It must have been pretty scary when it first came out, but even to this day, it still holds up. I know that a lot of modern audiences aren't interested in seeing older movies, especially black and white movies, and especially black and white silent movies, but I think if you're going to give a silent movie a chance, this is probably the one. The silence makes it creepier. I mean, you create the sounds in your brain. I think if it had sound, it wouldn't be as special. The whole thing has a surreal quality. The way the vampire Orlock moves about is very unnatural and unsettling. It has a nightmarish vibe that never lets up. You watch it and you go into this trance. I think part of its appeal to us Western audiences is that it didn't come from the Hollywood monster factory. This was made in Germany. For some reason that makes it feel a little more authentic. Dracula is more of a European type of thing. You know, it's like you have to get your champagne from France or else it's not the same. You know what I mean? It just feels closer to the source. I don't know. I first saw it in the 90s. I was interested in Dracula and vampires and I wanted to know where it all came from. I read the Bram Stoker novel, which was published in 1897, but as far as film versions go, there was a mention of a Russian version from 1920. I first saw it mentioned in the vampire book, The Encyclopedia of the Undead, which is the only place I ever heard about it. It doesn't have any information other than that it was a lost film. And in all these decades since, I've still never seen another reference or source anywhere, so I'm thinking it probably never existed. There was, however, a film from Austria called Dracula's Death, which likely premiered in 1921. From what we know, it was a very loose adaptation, it had almost nothing in common with the Stoker novel. Uh, this film's been documented and confirmed, but unfortunately the film itself has been lost. So Nosferatu is really the first adaptation, though it was unofficial and unauthorized. They did not get permission from Stoker's widow, and as the story goes, she sued them, and the court ordered all copies of the film to be destroyed. Well, they clearly didn't, because here we are watching it a hundred years later, so I guess we're lucky. The fact that it's still here, while so many other silent films have been lost, is quite a miracle. Despite having been sued, it was a fairly loose adaptation to begin with. The characters didn't even have the same names. Dracula's name was changed to Orlock, Renfield was changed to Knock, Harker became Hutter, Mina became Nina, and Dr. Seward became Professor Seavers. For a long time, the only version you can see was a public domain version, and this is the version I first saw. The image quality was very blurry and high contrast. It looked like it had been copied a thousand times. But whenever they translated the German title cards to English, they changed the character names back to the more familiar Stoker names. So Orlock is still called Dracula. And this used to confuse me. I never knew where the name Orlock came from. I'd read about it in film books, but I didn't see it anywhere in the movie. Furthermore, they even changed the names of minor characters and gave them names from the book too. The character Ruth became Lucy and Professor Bulwer became Van Helsing, though these characters have almost nothing in common with the book. So in general, Nosferatu changed a lot of things. The setting of England was changed to Germany. Orlok does not look anything like how Dracula is described in the book, nor does he de-age. He doesn't turn anyone else into a vampire. He never transforms into a bat, a wolf, or mist. He does not climb on walls. It's never shown that he doesn't cast a reflection. Crosses, garlic, and wafers are never used against him. There isn't even a legitimate vampire hunter anywhere. Sunlight kills him, where in the book it only weakens him. In fact, this is the movie that invented sunlight killing vampires. There's a shot when he's on the ship that has long been mistaken to be daytime, but this was actually a day for night shot, meaning it was shot in the day, but meant to represent night. And when shown with the original blue color tinting, it makes sense. So what does it follow from the book? Well, Harker travels to Transylvania, the townspeople are scared for him, Dracula is the coachman, 
Harker sells Dracula an abandoned property. Harker discovers Dracula in his coffin. He must sleep in his native soil. Harker has to make a daring escape from the castle. Dracula travels by ship. Mina waits for Harker's return by a cemetery near the sea, which is based on a real location in Whitby, England. Dr. Seward observes Renfield in his sanitarium. Lucy sleepwalks, except here Lucy and Mina have been condensed into one character, Nina. So by all means, it is an adaptation, just one of the looser ones. And I already made a heavy comparison of a dozen Dracula films to see which one is the most accurate to the book. If you want to see which film wins, check out that video. We could sit here and talk about every favorite Orlock moment, because almost every shot he's in is a worthy still frame. But there's a lot of scenes that don't involve the vampire that are also very memorable. The character Nock, who is Renfield, his first scene where he's giving Hutter the job to sell the property to Orlock is a real doozy. He's meant to be an eccentric character, but he goes really far with it. Some of his facial expressions are just as creepy as Orlock. In fact, when I first saw this movie, I thought maybe there was going to be a twist where he was actually the vampire all along. Of course, later he ends up in the asylum, but there's also a scene where he escapes and the townspeople chase him. This is another scene which was invented for the film and is so memorable that I've seen it imitated in other films like House of Dracula. There's also the guy in the bar with the mustache who warns Hutter not to go to the castle. He has that exaggerated type of silent acting and he must have totally been the inspiration for the mustache guy in the first sound version of Dracula, 1931. Especially there, the acting is so bad, it's hilarious. I can never forget about that guy. And Mel Brooks would later spoof the character in Dracula Dead and Loving It. Yes, that's where I'm going. To the castle. Yeah. No. Yes, I have business with the Count. No, no, no. You must not go. There's a lot of emphasis on the plague. One of the more disturbing scenes is when Orlok arrives in Germany, he brings death everywhere. So you have these long, morbid shots where coffins are being carried out on the streets. For a little while, you forget you're watching a movie. It seems more like old documentary footage. Very unsettling. Sometimes when I'm watching old movies like this, I feel I'm watching a record of history. It's old footage of people who are all long gone now. There doesn't exist a lot of behind the scenes pictures or interviews, you know, not the high level of documentation like any film that would come out today. That adds a lot of mystery and makes the film seem more intangible and distant. I prefer to know very little about Max Schreck, who played Orlock. We know that he was an actor and was in a lot of stage and film productions, but I like to think, who knows, maybe he was a real vampire. And that's the premise of the film Shadow of the Vampire, starring Willem Dafoe as Max Schreck, who is excellent. And also, John Malkovich is great as the obsessed director, F.W. Murnau. It's a great dark comedy that takes a different view of what it could have been like behind the scenes. The biggest tangible thing that still exists that appeared in the movie is the castle itself. Many Dracula films were shot on a set, Maybe they'd use a real castle as the exterior shot only, or a miniature or a matte painting, but Nosferatu actually filmed inside and outside of a real castle in Slovakia. It was called Arava Castle, it was built in the 13th century, and still stands up on a high rock. To this day, I believe you can still tour the castle, and many of the archways from the film and specific spots where Orlok stood can still be recognized. For the final shot, when the castle supposedly crumbles, they use the ruins of another castle in Slovakia called Starhad. Sorry about the pronunciation, I looked. F.W. Murnau became one of the great famous directors of the silent era, also known for The Last Laugh and Faust. A very macabre fact here, apparently in 2015, somebody broke into his grave and stole his skull. <laughs> Pretty messed up. Today, you have much better options to watch this movie. In the VHS era, it was released countless times, as you can see from all the copies I own here, because it was public domain, anybody could release it. 
The exact release that I first rented from the video store was this one here. I managed to track it down. It was the 1993 KVC version, also known as Carts with a K. The generic image on the cover is pretty funny. That's got to be the laziest VHS cover I've ever seen. Not to mention the picture quality was crappy. One of my favorite things about this release was the music. Because with silent films, there's no standard soundtrack. You either re-record it from the original sheet music, or you do a new composition, or you just buy some cheap stock music. All the music here was stock, but I always thought of it as the Nosferatu music. I even used a lot of it in my old movies that I made. I also remembered hearing some of it in The Blob, and later confirmed that a lot of the music on that VHS tape was originally composed for The Blob by Ralph Carmichael, which was later sold to the Valentino Production Music Library. And who owns all of it now would be a deep dive for another day. But with all the later DVD and Blu-ray releases, it's been restored with higher definition. They've retained the original title cards and even the original color tinting. So if it's a day scene, it'll be yellow, and if it's a night scene, it'll be blue. Personally, I don't care for the tinting. I like when it's just straight up black and white. Looks more spooky that way, I think. Also, with the newer versions, it's been projected at the correct speed, because with a lot of those silent films, they weren't copied correctly the first times, so they moved a lot faster. Because I've watched it more times with the incorrect speed, it now seems weird to me that the movie is so much slower. It adds a lot to the runtime, and it made me feel, you know, why is this dragging? I also feel the grainier image quality makes it more chilling because you can't see into the shadows as much. But with that said, I do recommend seeing a high quality version as that's the more proper way. That's more faithful to how it was when it was first released a hundred years ago. If you haven't, check it out. And while you're at it, check out the 1979 remake starring Klaus Kinski as Dracula, who also played Renfield in Count Dracula 1970. The 79 version of Nosferatu is slow moving, but the visuals are great. I think of it as the 2001 space odyssey of horror films. So now that Dracula has been in the movies for a whole century, tonight's a good time to celebrate. Turn out the lights and give it a watch. And I am aware there's a movie I think came out today about another type of bat character. I'll check that out and we'll talk about it next time.